What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? This is Muscle, and this is another Two Line Music Huts Entertainment Report podcast. And tonight, we got a Canadian superstar legend when it comes to the music industry. Listen, this man here is a producer, a DJ, a radio man all around. He's been in the business since 1987 and up right until now, 2020. You know who we have in the building today? We have Mastermind in the building today. What's going on, yes, my brother? Yes, sir. What's going on? How are you, man? I'm excellent. Yourself? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you for coming through. Yes, sir. You know what I mean? We've been working on this for a while, but you made it happen. No doubt. Um, I gotta always make everything happen. Come on, man. Welcome back to Scarborough. All right. Yes, yes. <laughs> We're in the borough deep. Yeah. Deep around here. Yeah, man. Question for you. Yeah, man. When it came to hip hop, yeah. all right? Do you remember when you first heard hip hop and fell in love with hip hop? Hundred percent. Yeah. So uh, I was a, a young kid, could have been twelve, thirteen, downtown uh, at Eaton Center, and uh, we came out the Young Street side, uh, which was just south of Dundas. There was an entrance there, mm-hmm. and uh, as we came out, there was a group of people, huge group of people, just cr- crowded around, circle yeah. wise, and uh, and. Um, Obviously, you know, we were curious as to what was going on. We we're smaller, so there was a, an electrical system box or whatever there, and we climbed okay. up. Somehow yeah. we got up to the top. <laughs> that was the only way we were going to be able to see. Yeah. And it was a bunch of guys breakdancing. And we stayed there, me and whoever I was with, we stayed and watched this for however long it lasted. Yeah. And I was hooked at that point. I was, like, enamored with what this, what I was being exposed to. Mm-hmm. And I lived uptown. I lived uh, Finch and Leslie area. And, mm-hmm. and um, I, you know, I wasn't, other than, you know, my cousin, who and he was in Brampton yeah. and, and uh, a little older than me. Other than that, I was never exposed to, like, there was no hip-hop on the radio. So unless you were really in the know or you had relatives in the States or somehow, you know, were able to, and again, if I'm grade 12, I'm still, I'm sorry, if I'm 12, you know, it's whatever, it's grade six or something like that. I don't remember exactly. But I wasn't even in junior high at the time, right? So, um, yeah, so maybe I was even younger. I can't can't remember now, but... um, so in my neighborhood, it wasn't like there was a bunch of stuff going on. So it was kind of like I was only getting exposed to it where I would see. So if I went to a store, and back then they, you know, breakdancing was starting to pop off. So there okay. would be like compilations, you know, they would sell in, you know, Zellers or whatever, Wilco or whatever was back then. <laughs> and uh, one time, um, while I was at the school park, somebody was around there with their radio, and they were playing. Um, breakdance music. I don't think it was even hip hop, but whatever, 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 whatever it was back yeah. then, they were playing it, and I somehow, you know, got enough courage to walk up to these because they were older than me, obviously, mm-hmm. right? And I said, "Yo, where, like, where are you getting this? Where, where can I hear this stuff?" Yeah. And they told me about uh, a radio show, um, Saturday afternoons, one to four, eighty-eight point one. And so at that point, I made it a mission to to listen and 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 find this radio station and so on and so forth. So. Um, you know, at the time, CKLN didn't have a huge wattage. It was only like 50 watts. It was it was hard. It was it's Ryerson University's at the time, yep. um, their radio station. And so, whatever that first Saturday came around, I was in the backyard on the deck with a little box and a you know a tenna and a coat hanger yeah. and whatever <laughs> I could do to try uh-huh. to to get this. It was mad staticky, and I know I got those tape. The tape literally tape one is somewhere in my basement in a box. I know for a fact. Okay. And um, uh, I started listening, start recording, and it became an obsession. Um, you know, Ron Nelson was the host of the show. Yes, yeah, so we're uh, talking about the Fantastic Voyage program is absolute, what you discovered. Yes, absolutely, right? So the Fantastic Voyage program on 88.1 CKLN, hosted by Ron Nelson, Saturdays 1 to 4. And basically from that point, my parents knew, listen, on Saturdays, yeah. that's all I'm doing. <laughs> uh, you don't, I'm not going to Sears with you guys. I'm not going to Food City with you guys. I'm not doing none of that mm-hmm. between 1 and 4. You know, I went out and I would buy cassettes and I would have them all lined up ready to record and all Saturday. that stuff. Um, and, and, and yeah, so, like, I, I really, you know, looked at Ron like he was, like, a, a, a hero, right? Yeah. Like, he was giving me the music I wanted. I loved his show. And he was also, you know, interestingly enough, and I was, I was obviously too young at the time, but, um, you know, he was throwing events. Okay. So he was putting on concerts. He was putting on shows. Obviously, he was DJing out in clubs and stuff. Nothing that I could go to. Yeah. Um, I did end up 
in 80, when the hell did that album come out? So it was 85 or 86, LL's album came out, Radio. Yes. Right? And Ron was bringing him to concert hall. And I ended up winning tickets from Ron's show. Couldn't believe it, but I won a pair of tickets. Yeah. And I don't remember how. Uh, obviously, calling in and being the right person or whatever the case may be. But I won the tickets. Freaked me out. I, I didn't even realize. So I had my older sister take me to the concert. Because I was probably 85. I was... So if I was 15 and 87, so I was 13, Yeah, right? you're still, 12 or 13. You're still a super little kid. Right, and there was yeah. a concert hall, mm-hmm. and obviously it was a late night concert. So my sister took me. We went to this concert. That was the first concert I ever went to. Yeah. And, you know, just really, you know, really fell in love. And I was, uh, you know, probably going out of my way to try to buy records. There was yeah. two record stores downtown. There was Carnival Records. There was Star Sound. So at this time here, did you fall in love with radio also or this was you were more about uh, receiving the music getting the music yeah i never really thought about getting doing radio okay. uh, until much later mm-hmm. like um and it was kind of presented to me as opposed to me seeking it out okay um what i really was interested in was rapping and break dancing and the fundamentals um, of hip hop yeah and doing like mixtapes and 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 just you know, just learning about this music that I loved, and just I was a, I was a music nerd too. So I always you know like so as I as I started buying records, yeah. um, uh, I would read the record labels. I would you know the what what the label was, where it was from, the you know the people that wrote the song, yeah. uh, produced the song, what their real names were, the credits, and all that stuff. I was yeah. I was really into all of that stuff, and as time went on. Um, you know, I worked up enough courage to eventually go down to CKLN one day and meet Ron. Okay, um, this is your meeting. You're now meeting the yeah, God. Yeah, you know and I was I mean? shook, had him yeah. autograph a record for me. <laughs> um, and, and again, like, you know, I was a, a, a very obsessive kid. So, like, when I focused on something, I wanted to... I had to make it happen, you yeah. know what I mean? And so somehow I said, I'm going to become friends with this guy. I'm going to uh, get involved in his show somehow. And, mm-hmm. you know, w- uh, the 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 timeline, uh, you know, kind of gets convoluted. But uh, somehow I had become a part of Ron's street team. I had somehow connected myself <laughs> close enough. So he, Because what, what, he was doing a lot of concerts and parties and this right. time. So, so what he, he had is he had, a, he had a young crew of guys, and we would go out at nighttime. He'd pick everybody up. He mm-hmm. had a gold Toyota Tercel in the back. <laughs> <laughs> it, and it, and it kind of looked like a, uh, a station wagon almost okay. back back in, yeah. in in eighty days, right? And then the back was just boxes of, of poster, of flyer posters, and he'd get uh, four of us, so it'd yeah. be two guys in each team. Okay, and he would drop us off at intersections. So he would drop us off at one intersection, then he'd drive to the next intersection, drop the other Easy. two guys off, and while he's dropping them off, m- me and my guy were out here wrapping poles with the posters and tape. And by the time we're done the four corners, Mm -hmm. he's coming back to pick us up and drop us at the next one. And we would do this throughout. Like, so we we would go up along Finch. We would go up along the hot spots. We would Mm -hmm. do Jane. And and we would do it overnight. Yeah. Like, it wouldn't all be done in one night. But we would do a a, a big point. Like, you know, he'd pick us up at, like, 11. Yeah. And we would go out and do this until probably one. nobody is really around at that time. That's when you had to do it. it, Yeah. Right? (laughs) And so we would stay out until, like, one or two or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget the very first time I came home um, and the sun was coming up and again I'm not even 14 maybe and you're just and in older. hindsight mm-hmm. I'm like how did my parents even <laughs> allow like why would they even allow this yeah. and uh, I don't know how yeah. I can't I where's, can't even where's my child it's six o'clock in the morning either they didn't know yeah. or you know I was just such a bad kid that I was like I'm doing this don't yeah. bother me or whatever I can't remember but regardless mm-hmm. and what he would do is at the end of the night he'd feed us mm-hmm. and then the other payoff was we would get to go to the events for free we would get okay. tickets to go to the show yeah. right and to me that was a win I don't I don't need to I wasn't thinking about getting yeah. paid I was like I'm hanging with the guy who has the, the, the show in the city yeah. and I get to go to these concerts and I'm hanging and blo- you know what I mean so do you it, remember which one of your earlier concerts was outside of the LL Cool J one of the early ones you would attend 
there was uh, probably like because the, he did these uh, other events like he would have monster jams and Love he would jam. have right and mm-hmm. he would have um, uh, battles so mm-hmm. New York invades Toronto battles yes. right yes. and I remember the first one he did which was massive and he recorded it and he would run it run you know clips of it on his show um, mm-hmm. and it just made me want to like you had FOMO you're like I can't believe I wasn't there and um, and I think even before I met him mm-hmm. there was a club on Young Street between Finch and Shepard. It was called Casanova's. Yes. And he used to spin there all the time. And I think I, I went there, you know, as a kid. It was an all-ages event, so I went there. And I just literally stood in front of the DJ booth. This is before I met him, before. Yeah. This was just when he was a guy on the radio. Mm-hmm. And I just watched him DJ. And I, pro- and I and when I became a DJ <laughs> and I used to see people do that, it's so annoying, right? <laughs> but, but you got to think back. It's like, okay, you know what? I, I get it. it because. Right. Yeah. But so I can understand that he probably was looking at me like, oh, my God, I want to punch this kid in the face yeah. or whatever, right? And you're just, you're just mesmerized by mm-hmm. what you're watching someone DJ. You're hearing this great music. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget walking into concert hall for certain events. And back then, you know, the sound systems had speakers from the floor all the way to the second level. And you would walk in and the bass would cave in your chest. And it was just a it was a feeling that you can't um, very well explain. You had to just feel it. Right. And understand and be there and soak it in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for me, I always loved um, hearing music that I, I didn't know, like something brand new. Yeah. I was like, I don't, this is whatever this is dope, and I don't know, and it's playing. And yeah. rah, rah. so there was tons of records that I was exposed to in those environments as well as on his show. And, um, and all of that is what helped um, shape my love for hip hop. Going back to what your yeah. ultimate question was, mm-hmm. you know, do and I you remember? See, the trick with it is there's the component of radio, yeah. DJ, yeah. and music. All in and one. And break and, and, and concerts all that, yeah. and all of this all in yeah. one that you're being exposed to early. But again, you process it in your mind, but you're not really sure where you're going with it until I guess the time is right. Right. So then the first step was okay, cool. You meet Ron. Ultimately I wanted it. to be a rapper. There was that nothing was your, there was nothing else. Like again, I didn't care about DJing. Yeah. Um I uh, obviously I wasn't thinking about radio yeah. at, at 13 or 14. Yeah. I was just writing rhymes at home. I would listen to you know playback tapes and stuff and I would write my rhymes and uh and I thought I remember telling Ron one day to his face I said um, you're going to play my record one day blah blah blah. Yeah. I was a very confident kid. <laughs> at some point that disappeared or whatever when you finally when, when you, you understand life and understand what you're getting yourself into. And some rejection happens yeah. or some criticism happens then you realize, "Oh, okay, maybe I So did you actually record music or you that was just an aspiration? Um not until much later, but I mean, the most I would do is I would, you know, uh, play a music off of a, a off the record player, yeah. and then on a tape deck I would hit record, and then I would rap into the tape deck or whatever. You know what I mean? So, like, I remember w- doing a song very similar to Lottie Dottie, right? Because Lottie Dottie was a um, a song. It was a story song, yeah. right? And so I used that as inspiration, and it was just, uh, the song was called My Bike, and I was yeah. rapping about my my bike <laughs> and. Uh, and just dumb shit like yeah. that, and so again, this is kid stuff, right? Yeah. You know, there. And I didn't have a a, a group of peer, like I was I was very much a loner, like mm-hmm. maybe one or two other kids in school. This is probably like now grade seven that we're going into, and so one other kid who was into hip hop. Yeah. You know, my neighborhood where I lived, um, it was, you know, at the time. There was like that British New Wave invasion, so Techno-y like no we type. No, of. I'm talking like New wave? Thompson Twins yes, and Howard yes, Jones, yes, yes, and yes, that's yes, what was yes, popping yes. on on uh-huh. much music. Was it whatever TV was playing yeah, that? Yeah, much music. Radio was playing mm-hmm. that, and again, the only place we were being exposed to hip hop was during mm-hmm. Ron's show, right? Yeah. And so the rest of the time, unless I'm exposing myself to it, that's what I have to deal with. I have to deal yeah. with that kind of um, environment for the schools that I went to. And so, you know, a, a bit of a loner. You're sitting at home. You're writing your own things. You're, you know, you think you're doing. And, and my parents aren't into hip hop or anything. Like, so it's not, <laughs> no. like a, it's not like I'm going to. Yo, mom, check this out. Tell me what you think. Check you out know, the that, latest LL Cool J. Right. None yeah. of that's gonna happen. And even back then, like, you know, whatever money I was acquiring and buying whatever records I could, my parents just thought it was a waste of money and didn't, you know, see. I didn't even know there was a long-term picture there, but yeah. they're looking at it as, like it's a waste of money or whatever. Um, 
and you know one thing eventually led to another and somehow ron started including me more into his show okay and um i remember in you know during some of these poster sessions these flyer sessions in the car we would do you know trivia and name that to just you know as we're driving and stuff and me being the nerd that i am i was always really good at it i would Mm -hmm. answer like yo i know who wrote that song i know he would bust a lyric to a song and i'd be like this is what that song is and blah 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 he eventually did that on the air with me okay he you know i called in one day or something and he's like i'm gonna put you on the air Mm -hmm. and we did this name that tune thing Mm -hmm. and uh i got all the questions right i got all uh, you know i did everything (laughs) the way i normally do and he's like you're the mastermind i'm gonna call you mastermind and so that's where the name came from so ron ron gave me the name and it kind of just stuck from there yeah and uh so at this point i'm probably 14 or 15 and uh there was a guy on my street uh who went to york university Mm -hmm. and uh he uh did a ska reggae show uh on the station there which yeah. was at the time was only closed circuit so it only you could only hear it on campus okay so in the you know the cafeterias or and the this is chry we're talking right about but it wasn't 5. it wasn't chry or it 105.5 because again it was closed circuit at the time right yeah. and if it was 105.5 you're only able to get it on Got campus you. yeah so it wasn't on a frequency anywhere but they were on the verge of getting there and so this guy on my street he says to me um yo man you should you should come they're looking they're looking to do a hip-hop show you should come and try to you know talk to the bosses and and, and I'm like i'm 15 years old they're not gonna give me a radio <laughs> show and again as you know I, I wasn't thinking about radio other than whatever my little involvement was yeah. with ron i was super content with just you know be playing the background like i remember one time i was down at ckln and he sent me to the record store because a record dropped and he needed to, yeah. he didn't have a chance to go and get it he's like yo here's money go buy yeah. the record and i just that was the, the 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 friggin' top of the mountain for me, you know of what I mean? Course. Oh my God, Ron said, "Go get this record." I, I, you know I got what it. I mean? Here, here you go, sir. Right, and so, you know, I was content with all that. Yeah. And but after after I did the the trivia on the air, you know, some of the older guys started paying attention, and you know, oh wow, this is the little nerdy kid, yeah. blah blah blah. <laughs> oh, you're a mastermind, eh? Blah blah blah, and you know, mm-hmm. just doing it like that. But anyhow, so eventually, the guy convinced me to go with him to York one day after school. I went over there. Um, he introduced me to the program director, and I said, "Hey, you know, my name is Paul. You know, the homie told me to come talk to you, but you're looking for someone to." He goes, yeah, "Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Do you know this kid, Mastermind?" And I was like, "That's me, yo. What are you talking about? <laughs> wow. That's you?" And I'm yeah. like, "Yeah, like." And then we start. You know, he he tr- did some stuff to verify what it, that yeah. it was me and whatnot. He goes, "I've been looking for you. Oh my god, blah blah blah." And then he basically offered me a show. And and uh, and I was terrible, obviously. Yeah. Like you know, you're 15, and and so it was you're just... 15 with your own radio show. So you went in as a DJ, as a nope artist, I... as an M. What was your role supposed to be in this show here? I was a host of like play hip hop yeah. for two hours. At the time, it was going to be a two hour show. Okay. It eventually exp- it was it, it, once the station went on to the frequency it turned yeah. into a three hour show okay so my show was on wednesdays from 6 to 9 p.m um and basically you just play music and i mean i emulated the new york shows that i w- was familiar with or very much ron's show yeah. you know what i mean it was funny like the, the pd had to like i would go on and all i would do is talk like i would play records and then promote ron's shows and stuff <laughs> and he pulled me because listen you can't this is a different show than ron's like yeah. you can't just talk about ron and bubble this is you and he had to kind of coach me and guide yeah. me and again i didn't know anything about it other than playing records yeah and i wasn't djing i was playing a record record would end i played the next record and it was so no now this is the second so then now you fell in love with the hip-hop yeah you were purchasing records buying records you haven't really become a DJ, but you're on your personality. Getting it. Like, those yeah. early shows were terrible, right? Yeah. And I was very shy. Yeah. It was weird. Like, for a kid that, you know, claimed to be so confident, Yeah. like, I had I had stage fright. Mm-hmm. I didn't like speaking in front of people. Okay. Um, and the way CHRY was set up is you'd have a, the studio where you would be in, and there's, like, a glass 
uh, a glass window, and then on the other side of the glass window is a huge room with a table set up in it with other mics, and that's where either other shows would perform, or that's where you would interview people from. Yeah. And if I was talking and somebody walked into that room and started looking at me, I literally would freeze up and stop talking (laughs) and and just, oh, yeah, like it just it would throw me off. Right. And so I um, it took a long time to really get the hang of things. And again, you 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 learn by watching other people. So watching how Ron would do it Mm -hmm. and watching all these other and and there was other people that did shows. There was a guy uh, named Mitch Winthrop who did a house show on Friday nights. And he really became like a mentor to me, um, kind of took me under his wing. And, um, and he was like a super really, you know, I really looked up to him as well because he was just a really good dude. Yeah. He actually went to York um, at the time and, and he became a pretty big DJ in terms of the house scene. Yeah. He was playing some big clubs and doing his thing, and um, and we became very close. And so he, lo- he was like an older brother in, in a way. Um, and so I looked at him. Uh, for a lot of guidance and stuff. So I got the show in 87. What was the name of the show at that time? The Jam Factor. The Jam Factor. Yeah. Okay. And I don't know where I came up with that. It was just some <laughs> stupid hip-hop cra- Like, my first rap name was Doc Cut because there was there was all this, you know, there was, there was the, you know, cra- Grandmaster Cut, yeah. and then there was Doc Ice, and there was, you know, all these different, you know, yeah. I just put two words together and said, this is hip-hop. Yep. <laughs> it has nothing to do with anything, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, and so you just there was no rhyme or reason to the name it was just that's the name yeah um and that was obviously before mastermind or whatever mm-hmm. but um so i got that show in 87 chry uh they eventually got their license um and they was small you know when i think about it actually i think ckln at the time was 250 watts and when chry launched it was only 50 watts and so chry at york university is right between keel and jane uh between steels and finch Finch, give or take right upper yeah closer towards steels right Mm -hmm. and so it was a smaller pocket that you could hear Mm -hmm. and you know if it was if it was struggle city to try to tune into ckln imagine how challenging it was but interestingly enough People found it. Like, the yeah. first day we went live um, and the phone started ringing, I'm like, how did you even know? Yeah. He was like, oh, I was just flipping through the dial and, and then I heard it. I'm like, wow, so random Yeah. that back in the days, you know, when you think about how discovery happened, somebody just turned on their radio and they happened to dial past 105.5 Crazy. and hear, hear hip-hop at this particular time. Yeah. All of this um, is pre, pre-internet. pre Oh, of course. Yeah. Right? And at least on a grand scale. Yeah. Um, and so I uh, got the show in 87, and it kind of just started from there. Um, we you know, started incorporating DJs that could actually spin. So I would host, and then there would be other DJs. Okay. And, um, you know, it, it, never, it never always worked out because I'm a very, you know, in terms of uh, – uh, a perfectionist in terms of how I want my show to be presented and and I always want I don't want to just work with yeah. somebody I want it to be a friendship if you're going to sure. be on the show with me we got to be friends I don't want to just meet up on Wednesdays we do a show you go about your business I yeah. go about my business I, I can't operate like that you know it's yeah. a partnership and a blah, blah. and so, so a lot of the people that I that we had on I had three different DJs and they just they, everybody always seemed to have their own agenda or it just didn't work out because we weren't uh, our personalities clashed or whatever the case may be but when I got to the third guy and I couldn't work with that person anymore, the program director came to me, the same guy, and he was like, look, man, we, we're not getting another DJ. You better learn or start doing this yourself. And I think the third guy, actually, I started to learn how to DJ through him because it was just that time. It was yeah. like start to learn, right? Yeah. So I, I don't know. I might have been 17 or something, and I finally started – to learn how to mix and because whatnot. Because you had records already. Because I guess that was the medium back yeah, then. Yeah, I was records, always, I was, records, I always had sense. records, but I yeah. was never two turntable. And the biggest thing is I could cut and scratch. I, for some reason, I learned on, you know, we had these little, they, they, they were like, it was like a tape deck, a stair, a radio, and a turntable all on in one top. box, uh-huh. right? And I would just use the volume control and I would cut and scratch. <laughs> um, and the thing would bounce all the time. Yeah. So you had to really have a delicate touch with it and whatnot. But I could, so I could cut and scratch to a certain degree, um, but I could never blend, right? Okay. So I learned, finally learned how to blend and and uh, and beat match and all that type of stuff. And so when the boss finally came to me and said, 
that's it. Yeah. You're doing this now. It was like he threw me into the deep end, and I just had to start, right? Yeah. And obviously, you're not going to be great at first, and you work your way into it. And eventually, you know, I was never, I never considered myself one of the better technical DJs okay. in terms of, you know, skill set. I was never a battle DJ. I was never, um, you know, the greatest in terms of cutting and scratching and all that. It was just, I was adequate. I could, I, I got the job done. Mm -hmm. And, I think somehow my my signature claim ended up becoming this guy's getting music before everybody else. So you were like almost like the Canadian version of like a DJ Clue. But before Clue. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and so that that's basically what it came down to, just getting records and tr and doing my best. So I was spent. I was going to New York a lot. I was going to conferences a lot. Okay. I was I was really hungry in terms of like. So this goes back to that kid, that confident kid, who wants to get the job done, the perfectionist. And it was like, okay, if I'm gonna do this, I want to be the best. I right. wanted no one's gonna be able to put out something better than me. And yeah. that's that was my mentality, right? Yeah. And. Um, and a lot of it just came, you know, for the love of the the culture. My friends, they were all within. At this point now, now I'm really starting to have friends mm -hmm. who are um, in the same lane as me. You know, they love the music. They they appreciate what I'm doing. They're they're like hyped to be cool with me because all oh, these sure. kids on the radio. Blah 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 That's, blah. And the radio is gigantic at that time. Yeah. Can you imagine a kid in high school? Like well, so, I you're see. in grade ten and you're on the radio once a week. Like, yo, be like, you you might as well be a drug dealer. The way how you're popping. <laughs> you're so they probably popular. Made, they would make more money than I would, but yeah, crazy. Okay, so when did the Russell Peters connection come in? Oh wow, so Russell was friends with my cousin, the same cousin I said earlier, right? Who, um, you know, he also. Um, you know, put me on like put me on a break dancing and mixtapes and back in the day when I was like I would always be he was in Brampton and so mm -hmm. we would go every weekend to his okay, house to and Brampton. you know what I mean him are like brothers. And so he went to school with Russell and me and Russell met in like ninety or something like that. So my cousin had a clothing line. Him and his three his two boys had a clothing line. Okay. And they opened a little kiosk in Bramley City Center. Yeah. And my girlfriend at the time uh, worked at the kiosk. Yeah. Okay. And so I was there one day visiting her and my cousin rolled up and Russell rolled up and he, they introduced us and me and him just clicked and became friends. Russell was a DJ on his own, right? Yes. Like he was he was deep in the in the uh, in the Indian scene at that. He was playing Indian parties and all that type of stuff. Hip hop or No, no. And I don't know what actually I never went to them things. So okay. I don't know what he played in them, Got but you. they were like day daytime parties cuz the, yes. the girls couldn't come out at night or whatever. So they would rent these clubs out during the day mm -hmm. and the parties would happen during the day or whatever. But he was DJing in that stuff. He was heavy into break dancing and all that. So he was like Russell was a hip hop dude himself, right? Mm -hmm. But that that's where he DJ'd. Yeah. And so, you know, we hit it off. And at this point, this is probably like ninety one or no, sorry, ninety. So I had already been on the radio for three years. Russell was a fan of, of yeah. mine, right? Okay. Because he obviously he listens and all mm -hmm. that stuff. And then the connection was my cousin. Um, and so we just stayed friends and we hung out and as my career progressed, um, you know, we I eventually, when I eventually got to Energy, which was in 94, mm -hmm. he probably didn't come on board until like 95 or 96 or in and around them times. He was part of the Energy situation? Well, what happened was he would just come up to the station yeah. to hang out, yeah. right? And and um, and then eventually I would start putting him on the mic. Because he was doing comedy too, right? At that time there. Oh, yeah. Like okay. his first, like he was doing comedy at th I could be wrong, but, you know, he was probably doing comedy from, like, 89 or 90 at the very least. And his first show was in 92 or 93, which was at the Far Side Show at Opera House or whatever. It was, like, his first real live in front of a big crowd type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and... and um, and so he was already established in that scene or becoming established in that scene. And me and him, you know, I would go see him. As friends, yeah. we were doing other things. Like he would come to events, concerts, but he was never really, you know, he wouldn't come to CKLN because after I left CHRY, I went to CKLN with X. Okay. So, yeah, I keep jumping around. So <laughs> I left okay. CHRY in 91 and X said, hey, come be a part of our show. So I was with X from 91 basically to 94 when I got the, the job at Energy. Energy right? So 
all through that time, we were always friends, like me and me and Russell, and hung out and you know went to events together, went to parties together, and blah. And he's a couple years older than me, okay. so there were certain things that he would go do that I didn't care to do, or if I had to go DJ and he wanted to go to the older shit or whatever, the nineteen plus, whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's what he was. He would go to or whatever the case may be, because I, I was working a lot too, right? Yeah. I either was school, then whatever my part time job was, and then DJing on whatever nights I'm DJing. Plus, I got the radio show and bl- okay. You know what I mean? so, so you were working a normal job as a kid in the middle of all of this also oh yeah yeah yeah. yeah. so 89 i started working at jumbo video and this man said jumbo yeah. video boss yeah and so uh while i was in high school and then college and then uh the only time i quit is when i got the job in energy yeah. at that point i was like and i and i was always djing too mm-hmm. and so i um you know, whatever DJ money I was making on whatever nights, that was helping to supplement it. The the jumbo video was just going right into the bed. That was like yeah. the day job or whatever the case may be. And then um and when energy happened, I was like, Okay, let me let me just focus on this because that, that's a that's a new level. You know what I mean? And to get into energy, is this now, did this really change your career because now you got into like promoting events and stuff like this? No, I wasn't really promoting events. So what happened was I went to school for broadcasting. Okay. Right? Yeah. And so I, I went to Seneca College and I took their their um, radio television program. And... And I, I didn't, like, you know, the way radio works is I'd already been doing it since yeah. 87. Yeah. But for me, it was like I wanted the, the paper. Mm-hmm. I wanted to, if I went in to go talk to somebody, I can say, yo, I went to school for this. Yeah. As opposed to, sure, I earned my stripes by actually yeah. doing radio. Yeah. But I also went and got educated for it. You have it to and, understand and, the technical aspects of what you're doing. Right. All of that. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there was stuff I learned that I didn't know about. And, yeah. you know, and, and, and it... Uh, Obviously, on a resume or whatever, it's always going to look good too, sure. if that's the field you're trying to trying to get into. Mm-hmm. And so, um, when energy happened, it was literally a month after I graduated or whatever. I had been bugging them probably for a year out. I okay. would I would be pressing their program director saying, "Look, you guys, you know, you 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 you're playing dance music and whatnot, but you have a reggae show, yeah, but you don't have a hip hop show." Oh, they had a reggae it's show, like on a Sunday night. Okay, like two hours, maybe or one hour or whatever. And the only reason they had that is because the, the the station manager mm-hmm. was a Chinese Jamaican guy. Got you. And so it was that was his agenda, because right? Because that's he, a stretch to say, okay, dance music, right? Skipped over hip hop and R and B. Well, no, to because radio. in the evening apparently they started playing R and B and and stuff. Yeah, you know, in the evening show or whatever. Um, but I would hit him, and I'm like. How do you guys not have a hip hop show? Yeah. And so I would constantly say, say, you know, like he either, by the time they hired me, he either hated my guts or he admired my perseverance because all I was doing was once, okay, I'll touch back, I'll touch back, baby. Hey, have you decided or not yeah. you want to do a hip hop show? Like every couple of weeks, I was hitting this guy, yeah. and I was like, you know, it'd be it'd be great, you know, if you ever decide to do hip hop show, I'd love to come and do the show with you, blah blah blah. I'm just saying. Anyway, one thing led to another. They finally put it on their agenda to get it done. I was what the guy who got the show and um and you know from there it kind of, i just looked at okay so now i went from a small college station to another college station to now a bigger platform how are we going to help a it's going to make them the scene we're going to help cr- increase the scene but it's also going to help me as a For sure. as a dj and a personality it's a win-win and it was also <laughs> You know, as a guy who went to school for radio, it's like, okay, maybe this can help jump off my, you know, because I was looking at like, I'm trying to be like these New York guys. Like, I want to be as big as these guys. Ebro and Rosenberg. But and they weren't guys. even there at the times. But we're talking, guy, you're talking 94. Okay, so this so it would have been cool flex. Red Alert? It would have been flex. It would have been Red Alert. Mm-hmm. Um, if High 97 started in 93, then, you know, their morning show was like Ed Lover and Dr. Dre. Yeah. And they would have had. Who knows who the, you know, um, Wendy Williams would have been on there. I'm sure Flex was on there. I don't think Angie came into the fold as yet. No, she was a couple years Mm -hmm. later or whatever. But still, Mm -hmm. that's what I was looking to ultimately. I'm I'm trying to be on the radio. I want it to be a career, right? So energy happened uh, in 94. And again, Russ probably didn't come around. And again, we were friends this whole time. But Russ didn't probably come around as far as being on the show till 95 
mid 90 to late 95 or whatever like uh and he would just come up to the station to hang out mm -hmm. and then i would eventually just start putting him on and be like yo russell peter's in the house yo what up and he would talk and then it just became such a cool chemistry between us mm -hmm. you're already friends and then we're cra you know i'm the straight guy and because he was also like such a hip-hop fan as well a super hip-hop nerd and a dj and all that stuff it just made sense for him to come and he just came every time and he just yeah. you know again he didn't work there or anything but he just kept coming up because he loved it he wanted to be a part of it and, and at the time it was good for him and exposure for him as well mm -hmm. as a comedian and everything that he was trying to do and um basically he was like a pretty much a part of it until i think i left energy in like 2001 2001 okay this is where you now enter you're in the big leagues already by energy, but now you've entered a different space. As in, I think this is when you left and went to Calgary. No, not yet. You didn't leave. So there was a no, not not right away. There was mm. other things too. And while I had a record deal, I was doing mixtapes. Hold on, we need all of that mastermind. Listen, yeah. because when it came to even the mix, let's go down that road there. Okay. Mixtapes, okay. Yeah. How did you get started? Because I know for you, you did up to forty-eight tapes, tapes that one CD. Number 49 was the CD was and like, 50 was the album. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the mixtapes happen just as a DJ and, you know, one of the guys that are as an outlet for hip hop in the city, people would always ask you to make them tapes mm -hmm. or I would make tapes for myself and then they would get dubbed or lent out or whatever the case may be. They would spread. And um, it was probably like 92 or 93 and uh, two black guys, the yes. clothing store. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd be there hanging out or whatever, and they'd be like, yo, we need tapes for the store, guy. We need tapes for the site. Like, okay, no problem. I got yeah. you. I'd make them a tape. And then they would hit me like, yo, how many people want this tape, guy? You should start make like, yo, get, drop 10 tapes off here, and I guarantee you they're going to sell. Yeah. And I was like, okay, sure. Dub off 10 tapes. They sit and they fly. First day, gone. Crazy. Out the door. Crazy. And, um, and that kind of, it snowballed from there. So 10 tapes turned into 20, and then it turned into 30. And then you're like, okay, where are the other places that I can, not just two black guys, but what are the other places? Okay, there's the two record stores, yeah. there's Play to Red, there's barbershops. There's this. And I just kind of started turning it into a, like brainstorming it and turning it into a, okay, you there's, there's a, a market. You scale the business. There's a market there, yeah. right? And you're, you're also feeding um, a need. Right, I really didn't have to push it that hard. Like, you know, my name is being a radio DJ, mm -hmm. and you know, my tapes were never like I didn't have talking all over them. And you got to remember, at this point, there was probably Ron G tapes and Duop tapes and and uh, Kid Capri tapes and mm -hmm. all them stuff already existed. Yeah. But there was nobody here really doing it like that, mm -hmm. right? And so my tapes never had talking on it. It was ninety minutes of straight mixing. I was again, you know. Uh, at this point, I was the guy getting records before anybody, so I was having exclusives on those tapes that nobody, you couldn't get them anywhere else yet. Because okay. the way it worked back then is record labels would service the DJs yep. probably a month before the records come up because what the, pur the purpose is, okay, here's the record, mm -hmm. you give it to the DJs, DJs are going to play it on the radio and in the clubs and they're going to promote these things, build the hype, and then when it's ready to drop, in in this in retail, yeah. there's already a buzz built, and then other the, the retail people are going to yeah. go buy it. So you guys were a big part of the machine, to a certain degree. I think mm -hmm. so. You would yeah. you could argue that for, for sure, sure, right? Um, and it wasn't the Canadian scene. I was getting again because of my connections I'd made in the states through all my travels and all my uh, years of being on the radio. So if you're thinking ninety, that's already six years. Ninety three. I've already been on the radio, establishing Crazy. myself for six years, right? Yeah. And so playing hip hop, mm -hmm. right? Like this, the same genre. And so um, the mixtapes, uh, they really, they really started popping off. And like the the store that really, really set it into the stratosphere was Play to Record. One thousand percent. Right. So you had Play to Record, you had tracks, mm -hmm. um, but Play to Record is the one that really, like, you know, if 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 I was selling twenty or thirty tapes in these little spots, like, yo, they took it and it went, it went out of here. You know what yeah. I mean? Like Eugene would call me. He'd be like, yo, I need more tapes. Sold out, need more tapes. Yeah, and then, you, you know, again, you, you don't want to, you know, as a, as a guy who's making the tapes, you don't want to overextend yourself. So it's not like I'm going to make a thousand tapes and then be stuck with 400 of them. Yeah. You do it as the popularity. So it's like, okay, this month I sold 250 tapes. Mm -hmm. Now I know next month 
minimum you're making is 250 and then it could just go from there. And then the other benefit was, uh, you know, being on the radio, mm-hmm. I could promote that I was selling. Sell- oh, by the way, you you, know, you want to get a Mastermind mixtape? You can get it here. You can get it here. You can get it here. And that's that's great for the people selling them. And then it's great for me because it's just you know. And it was a so small it's a thing. It was win, 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 right. win, right you, across the You know the what I mean? So like you're you're gonna promote the parties you're playing at, and you're gonna promote you know where your tapes are. Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize how popular they were gonna become. And again, here we are in 2020, and people send me pictures of my tapes all the I time. I see them all the time. You know, people. Um, you know, people. Some people have brought them to me and, yeah. and just wanted to show me. And the fact that I was able to connect with these people on that level mm-hmm. is um, it's very humbling, yeah. right? And it's it's flattering. And it's like, because I didn't, you didn't go out of thinking that that's what it was going to be. Like, obviously, you wanted to make an impact. Of you course. wanted to, you know, if I said to myself, yeah, I want to be the flex for, you know, for Canada or whatever, yeah. you wanted to do that, but you weren't guaranteed that that was going to happen no. and and even in hindsight I don't necessarily consider my people equate that to mm-hmm. me but I don't consider myself that I just I'm just so happy that you know I was uh, at the the beginning of the scene and was able to contribute to a culture and a scene that I loved yeah. with people that I admired and uh, was a huge fan of and so you know knowing that um you know, as a brown guy, as a brown kid, I was a guest. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I w- and, and all I wanted to do was help elevate and contribute. Do your part for right. something that you love. Right. Mm-hmm. And if they, if I was accepted and I did it right, um, you know, under the right, um, um, the objectives were right. There was there was no ulterior motives or whatever. Yeah. Then I feel like whatever I did succeeded. You know what I mean? You my con- my contribution succeeded. It makes sense. You weren't being a culture vulture, even though that word didn't exist back then. Right. You know what I but, mean? And, and I wouldn't even have known what that was, but yeah. I definitely... And trust me, there were things that I looked at that were like, yo, that's... That's not what this is about, you know. Like yeah. when you look at certain Canadian labels, <laughs> who they would sign and what they would really, how what they would promote yeah. and what they would, uh, you know, push. Like, it's like that's not what we're, we don't do that over here. Yeah. You know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah. um, that did exist, mm-hmm. and I just wanted to make sure that I was on the right side of history as opposed to yeah. the wrong side. And so the mixtapes was popping, everything was great, and that 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 whole run lasted till about ninety nine. And then the problem was, um, you know, other DJs started doing it as well, but they they were taking it to a a more competitive level with yeah. the record labels. Okay, so then if we could be a hundred percent honest, it was Baby Blue right. that came out with the CDs, right? And that's when everything changed. Yes, you understand. So they did. They were great. Yeah, you know, in in terms of b- building up their fan base. But what they were doing is they were. Um, Basically making compilations, you know, with the, with their flavor, you yeah. know, with Kid Cut doing his thing and and however they mix. I've never listened to a Baby Blue tape in my life because I've never needed. But the thing is, I never needed to, right? Okay. So as a, as a guy, they never had music that I wasn't going to have, Got and you. so uh, it, the purpose of listening would it wouldn't appeal to me, right? So were you guys competitors? What in a friendly way? Okay, right? we were. Oh, we would. I mean, you competed with everybody. Like me yeah. and X were competitors. Me and Scratch would have been competitors. Mm-hmm. Blue would. It's just we were all competing for the same Got space, right? Mm-hmm. But we weren't directly comp- competing, so to when speak. When I see right? Mastermind, it's on on site. No, there was right. none of that. You know what I mean? Like maybe they had that relationship with certain people. Yeah. Like I didn't. I didn't beef with nobody. Yeah. Like I felt that I had established myself. To a certain degree, and it's like even if we were playing the same event, like th- there were instances where, um, you know, DJs would catch feelings because they're supposed to be the undercard or you know, the headline or whatever. And I'm like, they would get on, and they want to spin all the records and blah blah. I'm like, yo, be I catch the same check at the end of the day? If you want to go shine and wreck the party, because you know when yeah. twelve o'clock comes around, I'm not gonna play. Yeah. If you spun every tune, I'll be like, keep going. Mm-hmm. I'm good. And then you're going to have to deal with the promoter because I'll tell the promoter, I'd be like, this was the warm-up guy and look what he did. Yeah. You know what I mean? And for me, I wasn't a um, 
open format guy. Like when you look at crews like Blue, yeah. you know, they had an in-house soca guy and reggae mm-hmm. guy. They had their R&B guy and their hip-hop guy. I was pretty much a hip-hop R&B guy. Yeah. So if I got booked for a party, that's why I was supposed to be there. Whereas, you know, you look, at a, you look at a genius like Scratch who can play every genre of music. So he could literally play mm-hmm. from door open yeah. to party done. And no one else would really have to touch... A turntable. Crazy. Um, mind you, that's not how it worked back then. He mm-hmm. actually, you know, like Red Flame would be there, King Turbo would be there, or whatever, yeah. and they would, it, we would switch it out. But Mark is the type of guy that he could literally do it, do it on his own. But I remember at one point, and same like, with Blue, Blue, because yeah. they were self-contained. They had right? the thing yeah. But I remember at one point, you and Scratch were going around. You guys had this four turntable remix thing. That you guys were doing for a bit, right? The the big one that everybody talks about was Wu Tang Clan yeah. at um, whatever that venue was in Scarborough. It was like Saint Clair and, mm-hmm. and Danforth or something yep. like that. And it's, it's Ella Banquet Hall, uh, right? Mm-hmm. And there's audio of it floating around. And the can thing I, is, can we I never be honest. Mm. I was the one that recorded that. Oh, did you really? <laughs> I was the one that recorded. All right, well, I you got the, the famous that. recording. <laughs> but the thing about it is, um, as much as you know, the promoters told us that's what they were trying to do that night. Yeah, we never rehearsed anything. It was all freestyled, and me and him don't spin the same. Yeah, he is it. The 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 technical skill that Mark has, um, uh, you know, from a blending standpoint. And again, he's not the greatest cut and scratch guy yeah. either right mm-hmm. like he just the, his brain works different in terms of selecting mm-hmm. and and his blending is just next level right mm-hmm. and so you know and my thing was the records i chose and a little bit of cutting and scratching and just but for some reason we killed it that night yeah. um you know and it just it's just one of those events that people still up to this day yeah. talk to me about because that was it was just this morning i was remembering that was a concert method man he was the biggest one out of the crew at that time there and he didn't show up well he yeah and in his place was odb yes it was okay you remember odb raekwon well i'll never I, forget when they had to announce that meth wasn't going to be there they went on stage mm-hmm. and they said all right um method man isn't going to be here and the crowd was about they went off he goes but mm-hmm. in his place we have ODB and then the crowd <laughs> lost yeah. it and it was just crazy and you know Soundman got beat up that night I mean, you're, you're inside my mind I was standing okay I told you I recorded it yeah, I yeah. was back there with the engineer where ODB came back I forgot what happened to his mic he came back and slapped yeah. the engineer he just kept to turn my mic up and it, yeah. you know the problem with hiring guys who aren't hip hop based to do hip hop events yeah. is they're never going to understand because they're used to doing rock events or whatever yeah. and it's not the same sonics it's not the same acoustics and who knows mm-hmm. the monitor systems and all that shit yeah. and rap guys are always going to be no. been out of shape anyway yeah. right and so it was Raekwon mm-hmm. and I think Ghost yes Raekwon it was either Ghost or Capadonna it was <clears throat> I, oh, always it get, been Cap. I always mix those two up for some strange reason yeah it was supposed to be Ray Ghost and Meth yeah I know Ray was there for sure so yeah. maybe it was Cap yeah and then ODB yeah. who really like just the crowd was yeah. so happy that he was there crazy and um and uh, and so that was a that was a, a pretty big night. So yeah, so me and Mark we played together that night, mm-hmm. and um, you know it, it, it's interesting because Mark is also a perfectionist, if you will. For sure. And I always would get nervous playing with him because I never because we didn't play we didn't DJ the same way. It wasn't the same. It you weren't the technical DJ. Not the same way. You and so the- I was so concerned about fucking up blends and not being on beat and just yeah. not doing it the way he does it. You know what I mean? And and as much as me and him were peers, I kind of, you know, you respected the guy because he was such a good DJ. And you're like, Crazy. I'm not trying to put wax sauce on this guy. Yeah. You know what I mean? And at the same, <laughs> oh, you're the reason that this shit was whack yeah. or whatever the case may be. But thankfully that night everything went smooth and and people talk about that event yeah, and, no, classic, and we had classic. and we had a few other parties where we spun together and stuff but for the most part i was a i was a single i was a solo dj you mm-hmm. know what i mean and so yeah so going back to the mixtapes blue started making cds yeah and so the problem with that is you're going from a medium that you know record labels don't quite feel you're you're encroaching on their territory yeah. to now putting out CD quality music that is now not being licensed Mm -hmm. and consumers are gravitating towards this because it's dope. Yeah. But 
you know, because those guys were like record labels at the time. All they cared about was dance music compilations and house compilations. Okay. They weren't putting out hip hop compilations. They weren't putting out, you know, uh, they weren't finding the Canadian guys to put hip hop together and doing licensing and stuff. It was, you know, much music volume four and it was yes. Chris Shepard and MC Mario and guys like that. Right. Yeah. And so blue came out, they started doing these mixtapes and, and good for them. They got a name for themselves. People are hyped about them. They start going into HMVs and start saying, Hey, you got, you guys sell the baby blue tape. Then what happens is the HMV guys then go to the record labels and say, yo, people keep coming in here and asking about baby blue. And now you've put it on the, the record label radar. Yeah. <laughs> and that's when the record labels are like investigating and then they're like yo you guys are putting out CDs and you're not licensing and then the much musics and all the people that actually have to pay for licensing they're like well how come they can do it and okay. and sell this stuff and we have to pay and blah blah so it turned into a big shit show and so in mid 99 to late 99 the same thing that happened in the states with um, the pirate music getting shut down there yeah. same thing happened up here and so that's when the mixtapes kind of died off but that in turn was a bit of a blessing in disguise because then what happened was um you know we had already established there was at the, you know between 93 and and you know where we were cur at that current time mm -hmm. 2000 99 2000 um the record label started developing uh, black music departments, urban yes. departments. Yes. And so we had certain guys within certain companies that were like, okay, look, we want to, we know we can't do mixtapes anymore. We want to make it legit and we want to sign you um, to put out an album. Okay. So now they're like, yeah. okay, we want to <laughs> do what those MC Marios and Chris Shepherds are doing, but we want to do it with you. Because you guys, I guess you guys basically, it was almost like they reverse engineered. You guys proved that, listen, this thing works. Mm. So then now we just got to go through the proper channels and actually make money together as a company. See, and and I DJ. never really looked at it that way, but it's very similar to what's happening now where there's artists that are out here using all the tools available to them via the internet and social media, mm. already creating a fan base and a hype. And then a record label comes along and says, okay, you have something. Yeah. We can help you take it to the next level. Let's yeah, do it exactly. together. Yes. Right? Hey, hey. Right. Yeah. They have the machine to push you through. Right. And so very similar to, you know, that concept is what, you know, Virgin EMI, mm -hmm. who eventually is well, who I signed with, they that was their idea. So they were going to sign Blue mm -hmm. to do the the poppier R&B, not okay. poppier, but the jiggy the jiggy stuff, mm -hmm. and then I was going to be the hip-hop guy. Yeah. And then we would just license the music, uh, just like everybody else, and we would yeah. put these albums out. You know, what happened was um, Universal offered Blue a, a, a nicer deal, I guess, or something, and they kind of snaked Virgin EMI, yeah. and instead of signing with Virgin EMI, they went with Universal. And then what happened was, um, and Universal had a huge... Um, catalog for urban music, right? This they, is they Universal were, the, we're talking about. We're talking about 99, mm -hmm. you know, Universal Music. If you go back to them days, they had a huge, huge chunk of urban music. Yeah. And as much as you had Sony as well, and you had, you know, Warner, and you had Virgin, Universal really was the top of the pile there. Mm -hmm. And they refused to license any music to us because at now we're competing. Yeah. They have a black urban compilation they're going to put out, and Virgin has a black urban compilation that they're going to put out. But we're not going to give you any of the records you want because mm -hmm. we're going to save them all for ours, right? And so that kind of fucked us on our side. Mm -hmm. And so we had to kind of rethink what we were going to do with the album. And so, you know, uh, again, as far as cassettes were concerned, I stopped at 48. That's okay. where we ended. Mm -hmm. And then the the concept that we came up with was tape 49 was going to set up volume 50, volume 50 being the album. So this was all brainstormed. We all yeah. sat in a room. We figured out what are we going to do? And they liked the idea of continuing the concept of the mix. You did 48 tapes. Yeah. No one's done that. Blah, 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 blah. Let's continue that. So tape 49, basically what we did. And, and I was known for really heavily supporting you know, Canadian artists that I believed in yes. and helping develop careers for certain, you know, Socrates, Jacques Claire, Cardi, Julie Black, all these artists, they all uh, in some capacity came through me, my tapes, my shows, mm -hmm. whatever. And so the concept for Tape 49, it was called The Setup. And we basically got the cream of the crop of uh, Canadian hip hop artists at the time. And we had them freestyle over... Uh, over beats that we had access to okay. and um, put out a, a, a tape of 
<laughs> 20 tracks or uh, I don't remember how many. But that is, in and of itself, people talk to me like they that's an iconic kind Beyond. of mixtape, right? Beyond. So because I tell people when it comes to Canadian hip-hop, there's actually four levels. Where the bass is the Mishi, Dream Warriors, Maestro. Maestro. Yeah. That's bass. Second tier would have been like the Cardis, the Julie Blacks, even though she's more R&B by hip-hop, Socrates, Chocolate. Yeah. That's second tier. Third tier was the mixtape as in the street guys. This is where a lot of the, um, the Don Millions and those guys came in as in the street guys. And then fourth and final where we are now is the Drake, Drake. the Tory Lanez, and the Nabs, the, yeah. all of that. That's where we are. So you yeah. came in basically, you helped build the second level. Well, yeah, I was there for the first level too. Yeah. Cause I mean, no, for sure um, from 87. So you yeah, were there, yeah. but your hand yes. that you could say I built yeah, 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 was yeah. second level yeah, is for what sure. you for sure. That it, record it, it, yeah. So there's definitely some history there. Right. Mm -hmm. And so 49, um, you know, it was, was, I was very happy, uh, with how that came out. We produced that at, um, uh, at Agile Studio here in the borough. Okay. Uh, we had all the artists come through. We yeah. scheduled it all out. Um, and again, this is, I was doing this while I still had my show at Energy, right? Which, um, I can't remember, but at, at some point I evolved from just doing the hip hop show to being like their evening jock. Okay. So I was on seven days a week, basically, because I was on Monday to Tuesday midnight doing the hip-hop show, and yeah. then Wednesday through Sunday, I was doing their evening show. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I was just a hungry guy that I was like, yo, I'll, I want to do it all. Then the record label came, and then that took a huge chunk of my time. I know it caused mad grief in the cribble because the kids were young, yeah. and my wife was working, and, you know, she thinks I'm, she thinks my job is just all fun. <laughs> oh, you go to parties, and you, you're in a studio, and you're shooting videos. Yeah. That's not work. What do you you know how hard that is right it's it's not that it's it's you know it's, it's not obviously the equivalent of you know laying brick or paving right. concrete or whatever but it's very time consuming and it's a very um brain heavy yes like you have to yes. be on your on top of the, you have to think mm -hmm. a lot you have to be performing mm -hmm. and um and i was still djing parties so i remember like on a friday i'd be up early with the kids in the morning because she she worked an early shift so okay. i'd be waking up with them dealing with them in the morning in school or whatever my daughter wasn't in school at the time so i'd be taking care of her all day when my wife came home she'd need to nap so i uh, and then i'd have to leave to go to the radio station yeah. After the radio station, I would go to do an event. Mm -hmm. I remember for a period of time, I had a residency in Kitchener on Friday nights. I'd be driving back at 2 in the morning, like, begging that I didn't yeah. fall asleep. Like, I was calling anybody that I think yeah. would be up at 2 o'clock. Stay like, with me. Yo, just talk to me while I drive home, guy, because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm literally going to fall asleep, man. And and so, anyway, mm -hmm. it it's just, you, it, there's so much stuff you would do that's behind the scenes that nobody knows about yeah. or, or thinks about. And, uh, again, this is, you know, we're working on the album at this point, so there's brain, there's, you know, production ideas you have to come up with what the concepts are going to be and this is all new for you oh yeah because yeah. i didn't pursue this yeah right i wasn't out looking for a record deal they came to me it seems like the only thing you ever really did pursue was okay i'm gonna go to school for radio right but everything else just seemed to happen to fall in your lap okay i just happened to be here this just that just seems to be your life well the interesting thing is if we go back to when i was like a 12 year old and i said i'm gonna be a rapper yeah i guess making music yeah it eventually happened okay just you know? not with you on the front of the mic you not with you behind the mic but you're in front of the mic directing them say hey this is what i need done right and that was a great that was a great fun you know, very fun experience. It was, uh, you know, there was obviously there's frustrations that happen, there's challenges that happen, mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, it was great. You know, when the album was done, I got to tour the country. Me and Shaq Claire went on a countrywide tour, so I got to see, you know, every nook and cranny of this country yeah. um, while bringing hip hop to those places. Um, you know, and Shaq Claire has already been established at this point, yeah, right? Like he sure. he was already doing this thing independently. Then he already had his al the first album. Um, I think came out in 90, Ice Cold came out in 99 yeah, on that, Virgin that had Let's Ride on it right so that was like he's already a star at that mm -hmm. point you know what I mean and so when I came along in 2000 um, he was working on his second project so that's why we went on tour together and, yeah. and obviously he was on my album was he on my album? he had to have been on my I, album I'd say most it almost seems ludicrous to think that he's, he wasn't on it 
Yeah, I can't yeah. remember. He might and not have been. Yeah. Or we licensed a record or something. I can't yeah. remember what the something case may like. be. So that really changed the trajectory of your career at that time there. Right. Mm-hmm. And so um, around the same time that the album was out and I was doing all this stuff, we had gotten a new boss at Energy. Mm-hmm. And he, he was an interesting dude. And for some strange reason, you know... There's it's I look at it's weird like you would think that like when you equate it to like a place like Hot 97 where they went out of their way to try to make their jocks superstars mm-hmm. and have other things so Flex has an album deal Flex has a TV deal he's on he's our evening show we want all of that because it just helps us of course our program director almost felt threatened if you were doing more than just his his ra- like if you're doing something and you become bigger than the radio station he didn't like it so I remember coming back from that tour mm-hmm. and they fired me. Wow. Yeah. So, um, you know, and that happens in radio. Like, yeah. you know, they call it restructuring or whatever the case. Was. But I knew it was whatever. Yeah. And it was just weird to me. I'm like, you have a guy that has a record deal making videos. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're they're promoting the shit out of him and all these other mediums. And instead of embracing that and, and using it to your advantage... You're like, yeah, I'm going to get rid of this guy. It wasn't like I came to them and said, oh, I want more money now or anything. It was like, you know, it just didn't make any sense. So between 2001 and 2002, I was kind of just still DJing, you know, if the record label stuff was still happening, it was cool. Mm -hmm. Um, But obviously radio was my passion. That was the thing that I was into. And, um, And Flo had launched at that time. That's what I wanted to get into. Right. So yeah. Flow had launched, and before I had left Energy, I helped. You know, I was involved in writing letters for them and, and okay. doing things to help, you know, encourage. Because, I, again, I yeah. didn't – to me, it wasn't competition. It was like this city needs a black urban radio station. Yeah. It, you know, it deserves it. So Because a lot of people don't realize Energy was in Burlington. It wasn't in yeah. Toronto. No, it wasn't. Yeah. So yeah. then that was different. So then now Flo was positioned to be in Toronto. Correct. You understand. Right? Yeah. And again, Canada's first black music radio station owned mm-hmm. by a black company, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I had discussions with their program director and some of their management team at the time. And they were like, okay, well, when you leave the station, when en- when you leave Energy, we got a job for you over here. And I was mm-hmm. like, perfect. I was obviously one of the more qualified people to you know, be involved. Um, some weird shit happened with their PD, some snaky shit, and yeah. she just it just never gave me the job. She, I, I heard about her, I right? Heard. So heard. Uh, you know, it went from you know having great meetings to her not act like acting like she didn't know that we never met before. It was really weird. Yeah, and so that just never happened. But one of the silent partners of Flow, mm-hmm. they uh, a, a broadcast company that had other properties throughout the country they owned a a 30 percent stake in milestone okay and uh i would talk to their president saying yo guy like you know i should be on flow like make me make sense he goes oh and he and he kept telling me that he didn't have any power to influence that to make that happen and in hindsight what i realized was he he didn't want to make that happen because he was hoping that i would go to his station in calgary he was launching a hip-hop station in Calgary, and he wanted me to go there. And I kept telling him, I'm like, yo, guy, I'm from Toronto. This is where I'm from. I don't want to move. Why, why, why would I want to go to Calgary? Yeah. No, I don't, don't want to go to Calgary. What's, what's all the way out there? Right. Here? There's yeah. nothing for like, but listen, we're launching a station. We would love for you. We give you whatever job you want and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, you know, eventually you're like, you got to take care of your family. I need a job. And so when it finally gets to the point where you're like, okay, there's no other offers coming in. There's no other opp- opportunities. I need something. Yeah. And we have, you know, we have a big meeting at the Cribbo and we're like, okay, like, you know, are you able to transfer your job too? And blah, yeah. blah, blah. And one thing led to another and eventually we had to make the move to Calgary. And, and that's on the other side of the country, boss. Oh man, it was, it was, it was a bit of turmoil in the house yeah. for a while because it, it was a big thing. Like taking two little kids, we have no family there. She, you know, my wife's leaving her family. I'm leaving my family. And at the end of the day, all it really was for mm-hmm. was to make sure that the family was straight. Right. Yeah. Like, cause if I had gotten a job in Toronto, I wouldn't have left. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Well, but then you see the trick with it is it's almost like, so then at that point there, you would put the radio above your DJing career. Because remember, you're 
doing big stuff in Toronto. Right. So then now when you go to Calgary, are you still going to be able to... Well, the interesting thing is I had built a name for myself with all of that stuff. So me going to Calgary was considered a big deal. Got right? It. Like the stations there were excited that this quote unquote star from Toronto was coming. Yeah. And, you know, we're lo- it was the first ever, it was going to be the second hip hop station in the country. Okay. Or maybe third. I think they had one in Vancouver already. Yeah. But point being that they were building it up to be a big deal mm-hmm. once I signed my deal and I agreed and all that stuff. And, for the most part, it was cool when we got there. You know, I mean, this the, the company that I was with was a real broadcast company with years of, of ex, of you know, being in business. It wasn't just you know like milestone as cool as the, what they did was. Yeah, they were a small business in the grand scheme of broadcasting. Got you. Um, and it just wasn't the same. Mm-hmm. Like you, know, you could tell the difference between the way this company was running mm-hmm. and and doing their station versus, you know, what the what Milestone was doing. Yeah. Um, at least from an industry standpoint. Like I'm not, you know, the public perception is whatever they yeah. believe it to be, right? But remember, when you're working in the back end, you understand it different. You're a radio guy. So I hear it, it different. I understand mm-hmm. it different. I see it different. You can yeah. tell the differences. But again, the public is never going to be as judgmental, right? Yeah. Like the industry people are going to be more judgmental. The same way if... If, you know, Floyd Mayweather is watching a boxing match, he's going to dissect it way different than just a, a person who's a fan of boxing. For sure. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So he's going to have a different perspective. And that's where it came down to, okay, so then look, this is what I want to do. We have limited time right now. Mm-hmm. So then we're going to skip over most of Calgary. Okay. Get back to Toronto. <laughs> and I have two questions. All right. I got to ask you also, and then we'll take it from there. Because again, you see, when you start flowing with a conversation, you don't realize how quick time goes by. Right, of course. And I'm glad you didn't wear a watch today, so you don't know what I know. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah, okay. You were in Calgary. You did, how long were you out there for? Eight years. Did you, did it become any easier or any better for you? Being there? Yeah. Um, I went through a period where I really started resenting being there because I initially, I, you know, everybody that I talked to before I agreed to the deal was like, listen, this will be great for your career. You're going to learn a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, If you're trying to do radio as, you know, beyond hip hop, Mm -hmm. this is great. So go there for a couple of years and then come back. You know, there'll always be a job for you eventually here. Mm -hmm. And so that's what my mentality was. We're going to go there for a couple years and then we'll move back. Mm -hmm. The reason it ended up being eight years is because, again, no opportunity presented itself Mm -hmm. back home. Which And I actively was pursuing stuff. Like I would talk to program director friends of mine saying, hey, you have any opportunities? And and for some reason, just just nothing nothing materialized, right? And Flo wasn't knocking my door down saying, yo, we want... Because I think, you know... It just it just wasn't whatever reasoning that milestone didn't want me in that building mm-hmm. is whatever it was. And so what happened was, you know, when they put the station up for sale in two thousand nine or two thousand ten, mm-hmm. um, and then Bell at the time it was CTV, but CTV bought them, yeah, bought the station. Um, that changed everything because that company is now going to put their footprint on it. So, um, you know, the company that I was with. In Calgary, uh, we parted ways in uh, mid of 2010. Okay. And, <coughs> pardon me, and um, the, the CTV-owned station in Calgary um, presented me with an offer. And they hired me, and they, well, they presented me an offer, and they basically said, look, we know you want to go home. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Sorry. Um, we know you want to go home, but we just bought Flow. Yeah. And... Um, if you're already part of the company, it's a much easier transition to get you into flow yeah. because that's a transfer and you're already here. Yeah. And we need you. We think you're – because at that – like for being eight years on the radio in Calgary, like when I left my show, yeah. like my numbers were ridiculous, right? Like I – I was number one by leaps and bounds okay. in my time slot. Yeah. And so they were like, if they don't want you, then we'll take you because you're a big name in the city and blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, everything that they're saying makes sense, right? This gives you your back, you're in to get back to where you want to go home. Right. And then go to Flow, which is in Toronto. Right. So that's basically how it went. So I got in at CTV, and they started having me discuss with the, whoever the guys were going to run flow were. Mm-hmm. But they weren't going to get the keys to the building, so to speak, until I think it was February of 2011. Okay. So this is the end of 2010. 
So I worked at that CTV station in Calgary for probably five or six months. Mm -hmm. And then February of 2011 is when they fired everybody at Flow. There was that big thing that happened at Flow. Uh And I wasn't even in town. I was Mm -hmm. still in Calgary when all that was happening. And I remember it was a big brouhaha and people thought I was involved and stuff. And I was like, I'm not even here. Like, why? I don't even work for them. You know what I mean? Like... (laughs) Yeah. Anyway, so that happened, and it was mm-hmm. obviously it wasn't a good thing when it happened, um, but it happened. Mm-hmm. It is what it is, um, you know. And CTV had then become Bell because Bell bought CTV or whatever, and they felt that they were doing whatever they needed to do to make that station uh, more successful or better or whatever the case may be. And um, you know, once they did, so they did that. Uh, in February Mm -hmm. and a couple of weeks went by and then they called me and they say we need you here first week of March and I was like all right yeah and you know my my kids were still in school my wife was Mm -hmm. obviously not going to be able to get a transfer um, but I was like okay no problem I'll be there let's let's make it happen so um, March of 2011 I moved back Mm -hmm. And uh, I had been there literally up until March of this yeah. year. March, your your life is so right. <laughs> your life is so weird, boss. Yeah, you know what I mean. Okay, weird. so then I want to dissect this a bit. So then you got back February. You said uh, twenty eleven. Yeah. Ish. Well, March twenty eleven. Yeah. Okay, so then now when you got back to the building, who was in the building at this time here now? Morning show was JJ and Melanie. Mm-hmm. Midday show was Miss Ange. Mm-hmm. Drive was uh, Jenny. Mm-hmm. Evening show was Peter Cash. And I was the swing weekend jock and the assistant music director. Okay. So uh, Justin Dumont was the music director. The program director was uh, a guy named David Corey, um, who also was the PD of, uh, of Chum FM. Okay. Right? And then they had a, a, an assistant program director named Scott Morello. So those were the ma- that was the management side. They hired me to be the weekend swing jock. And a swing jock basically means that if anybody's sick or on vacation, you fill in those positions or any. So you're having to work your way back up the line. And I and I was Toronto. comfortable with that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like to me, it was like um, I'd rather take one step back and knowing um, my talent, work ethic. You know, commitment, my drive. I know that that one step back will turn into three steps forward eventually, right? And that's eventually. It, it, it was inevitable. Like I was on the air so much as a swing jock mm-hmm. that it would have been. Uh, it would be more than if I was just doing a regular shift. Like they had me God. filling in the morning show. They had me filling in the evening show. They had me doing drive. They had me doing everything plus my weekend shift. Mm-hmm. Like I was on the air so much. And actually, at the time, they still wanted me in Calgary. So for about six months after I moved back, I was still voicing whatever show I was doing in Calgary. Okay. Um, and so I was catching two incomes and blah blah blah, and it was it's still you know I mean like those are the Hustling. things that those you are the hustle. right and the, the the reason I was able to do it is because the kids were still in Calgary, mm-hmm. you know Grandma flew out there to help oh. my wife take care oh, of them. So and you t- came back alone. Yeah, I didn't realize yeah, that. Part yeah, there. so I was yeah. here dolo for until summertime because when they finished school, that's when yeah. I brought them back. Mm-hmm. And my wife actually she had to stay there for an extra four or five months because she had to wait to get her transfer. Yeah. It was really a weird yeah. time, but it. It, in the end, it all worked yeah. out, right? So then you get to Flow, where Flow has now restructured. They're bought by Bell, bought back by C. It was CTV bought them first, and then Bell, right? Bell Media. Bell okay. bought CTV. Yeah, right. So okay, you're there now, and then now it changed from Flow to the Move, and you were still that there? was much later. That was much later. Yeah. yeah. So, <coughs> so what happened was Bell wanted to buy Astral Media, mm-hmm. and. To do that, they had to diversify some of their properties because any company Mm -hmm. can only own two FMs and two AMs in any market. Got you. And so Bell already owned two FMs. And if you're buying Astral, who owns two FMs, now you have four. Yeah. You got to get rid of a couple, you have right? To offload. And so they offloaded Flow and they offloaded uh, Boom at the time, and um, and so they kept whoever they want. They they decided to keep Scratch, mm-hmm. right, and keep, put him onto Virgin, mm-hmm. and they kept uh, Dumont as the pro as the as the music director. Yeah. 
and then everybody else got um, put into divestment, which would, they waited for a company to buy the two radio stations. So okay. the, the two stations were up for sale, but in all the, po- the CRTC politics and all that shit, they couldn't necessarily run it. Yeah. They had to put it in this divestment company, and there was some random guy that kind of oversaw everything, and they had a bunch of... so. Bell decided to get rid of whoever they wanted to get rid of and then made them all go to th- those two properties. So Boom had a group of people and yeah. Flo had a group of people. And um, and then eventually a company named Newcap bought the two stations. Okay. And so this was probably in like 2014 or something like that. The move thing didn't happen until like 2016, I think it was. <laughs> That's when they ch- – so the move, didn't it didn't last too long then. Um, the move lasted about a year and a half, two years maybe. Yeah, that, that's that's a little blimp in the hole. Yeah, it was a it was a grand mistake, mm-hmm. that, but it wasn't. The, there's so much. It's way too in depth to get into it all mm-hmm. right now to explain it all. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was a method to their madness that they were hoping would work. Yeah. But they just did it wrong, and it just didn't work the way they were supposed to, and um. And then eventually, I think it was the end of 2017, they flipped back to hip hop. Yeah. But it was weird because they didn't change the name. Right. right? So they kept it the move and they went back to hip hop. What full, was the whole point? Uh, it was just, again, yeah. just mistakes here and yeah. there, weird stuff. But Learn as you go. You know, it is what it is. Okay. So then now, yeah, you guys, you got in flow couple there for a couple of years then it moved to the move mm. and then it came back to flow right okay with that there now did they just change the name because okay we're playing hip-hop so let's just go back to our roots or there was some other intentions why they had to change back the name also to flow well no they but they realized that if you're going to be a hip-hop station the name flow is already entrenched with that mm-hmm. station mm-hmm. and uh, everything's money right you know this rebranding yeah costs money mm-hmm. you know all that shit costs money so that's probably one of the and then firing staff and hiring staff and blah 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 so there was mm-hmm. there was things that weren't done properly and in the, the the proper chronological order that it should have been done yeah and all this stuff um and it, it was and you know the, the interesting between 2016 and and the end of 2017 you know the 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 city shifted a little bit in terms of what was happening with hip hop mm-hmm. and the culture and the fan bases and the popularity of artists and stuff and they kind of missed the boat on that because they were doing this throwback and then eventually they turned it into a terrible dance music station right um and you were here all this time i was there all they knew i was unhappy yeah. they knew i was very very unhappy mm-hmm. but i'm not the boss i don't run the place so play my position. either either i'm gonna quit yeah or i'm gonna just keep catching the check and yeah. and see where what else happens you know okay. what i mean so then they're they're as you said they missed your mark and all this because i guess this is when drake and all, no no no, no drake before. has already drake been has been he did but, his 10 years already at that time no 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 he's six years in right because you're talking 20, 2016 yeah 16 yeah six yeah. years in 2020 would be 10 years in, yeah. no, yeah and so But there was other things that were starting to happen, right? Right. Like other artists were starting to develop fan bases that I had never seen before. Like it's like I've lived here long enough to know that, you know, Toronto hip hop, they don't get that kind of, you're not Drake, you're not The Weeknd. They don't get that kind of love without any outside um, cosign or influence. But I was seeing that, yo, there's people that are... You know, like my daughter was in high school and she's mm-hmm. telling me about artists that all the kids are into. And I'm like, you like this? Yeah. And but you know what I mean? Yeah. So um, they, they kind of missed the boat on that. So when you flip back to hip hop and you flip back eventually to flow, you have to rebuild all that. And then a streaming took over, like started to kick yeah. in. And you lo- you're, you're losing people that were like, so a kid that might have been 12, mm-hmm. You know, when you decide to flip to the move, who is now 14, who doesn't care about radio anymore because they're more, you know, doing things on their phone or whatever, Mm -hmm. SoundCloud, YouTube, streaming services, whatever, Mm -hmm. they're gone. Yeah. So how do you get them? Right, and then you got to try to convince the older people who may have stopped listening to you and found other come places. Back. You'll come back as we're doing mm-hmm. it, and it's challenging. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. All those things are challenging. All right. So then now, this is leading up to 2019, March 2019. 2020. You're talking about when I bounced? Yeah, it was. Uh, that was this year. It was this year. Yeah, yeah. I'm so confused right now. March 2020. Okay. A 
couple days before they let you go, what was the vibe like in the building before? Did you know anything was happening or this just came I ha- out of the I had like a feeling that something was weird. I thought they were going to flip the whole station. Okay. Um, and I, I even went and spoke to people and I'm like, yo, things, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just feeling vibes and stuff. And they, they're they not going to be able to tell you anything and they'll play yeah. it off and blah, blah, blah. So I actually thought they were firing everybody okay. and they were going to flip the station. And in turn, they only let go probably about five people, Mm -hmm. Um, me, the midday girl, a couple of sales reps, and um, our imaging director. Yeah. And to me, you know, uh, without going into it all, it was was all business moves. You know, some of it is financial. Some of it is, um, you know, I I would butt heads with management. I didn't like certain things that they were doing there. Yeah. um, How they were, you know, what they were trying to do with the radio station. And, um, again, I'm a purist. Right, so to me, uh, you know, the the the, the management already kind of they, they had been accused of being culture vultures. You know what I mean? Uh, in and around, and and again, as a person who defends the station, yeah. because it's again, we're still providing an outlet for hip hop culture mm-hmm. and black music. Sure, you can have a, a be disgruntled with the owners and management and whatever, mm-hmm. but the frontline people are still trying. So, so the morning show, the midday girl, me, the other hosts, we're still out here trying to put the best product out and represent the culture to the best of our ability. Sure. And so, we are always going to defend that, and I will defend that still because again, I didn't own the place, and I didn't. I didn't have as much influence as I should have had Mm -hmm. to run the place the way I believed it should have been run. And so I can't take the bullets for whatever people are describing, you know, whatever they didn't like. I can't take the bullets for all of that. You know what I mean? You don't have the power to make that type of change right away. So I can't, you can't blame me for something I can't change. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in that time period... Um, between 2018 and the time I left, you know, we, we I was fortunate enough to uh, create the Made in Toronto Takeover, yep. which was a super um, supportive program for Toronto artists mm-hmm. and give them an outlet that, you know, and, and a lot of people, you know, they'll criticize that, oh, it's one hour at nighttime, you know, and it's like, listen, it was on six days a week mm-hmm. and was it six days? Uh, sorry, Sunday, five days, five Sunday, Sunday to Sunday Thursday? to Sunday to Thursday. Yeah. So five days a week, five nights a week. Plus for two years, we did an all day made in Toronto takeover. Yes, right. So that I was like that. eighteen hours of playing nothing but Toronto artists, and you know they didn't have to do that. I fought for that stuff, yeah. and they were very supportive of it. You know, we we did a lot for that program, and so uh, uh, and I th- I believe it's still on the air. Yeah, all right, right. So I think Ricochet is still hosting that. Um, so I'm very proud of that. Um, and so there were other things that we did that uh, I believe are, are super beneficial for the scene, for the culture, um, and for artists. Um, and, you know, could more have been done? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I just didn't have the power, the clout. Yeah, just to just do like it. anything. Yeah. Two questions before I get you out of here. One last one on flow here now. You were on flow on your personality and all that. You got let go. A lot of people got let go. For a station that plays predominantly black music Mm -hmm. how come there's not a lot of black figures in that building right well it depends on what your take is so i you know whenever we would go to hire people i was you know when i was the apd Mm -hmm. i would be heavily involved in in hiring Mm -hmm. and at the end of the day you're gonna pick the people that are the best um at the job for sure and for some strange reason um there isn't a lot of um on air talent mm-hmm. that you know a lot of the people that would that would submit were from the journalist side and so they would be sending demos in like they're reading the news and I'm not looking for someone to read mm-hmm. the news I'm looking for someone to entertain okay. and a lot of people think that radio is just some easy thing and they, they some people think podcasting is the same as talking on the radio and what you have to do and it's so not mm-hmm. it is not even remotely the same yeah. um <coughs> And so, trust me when I tell you that I, you know, our searches were deep and thorough. Okay. And it just, you can only hire for the people that submit, especially like, I mean, sure, I could, I could look at somebody and say, yo, there's a black person there. I should put them on the air. Mm -hmm. But if they can't do the job, then they can't do the job. Mm -hmm. 
right? Like the, the girl that I hired for the midday, she was green. Mm -hmm. Didn't have a lot of on-air experience in terms of doing a show. Mm -hmm. And it showed when she got on the air. But I fought for mm -hmm. her because um, I said, you can teach someone to become a great radio person, a great jock. Yeah. You can teach that. If you put the work in, just like a basketball player, just like a hockey player, if you coach them, yeah. you can get them to be where you need to be. What you can't teach is culture. You can't teach hip-hop. You can't teach authenticity. And she lived that shit. Yeah. She exuded hip-hop. She was she sounded hip-hop. Yeah. She was a, a, a black girl. Mm -hmm. um, and she lived the culture. She's from the culture. Yeah. And I said, that's what you, you can't put this bullshit on the air because for a long time they had a bunch of people on the air that had no business being on a hip-hop station and I fought every day saying why are you doing this like it doesn't make sense yeah. and and so those were the, those were the battles that I had and, and who knows maybe those those arguments and those battles soured my relationship and that's why we are where we are now because what's so crazy is you and the uh, midday girl we're talking AW here yeah. Okay. Yeah. She was, she was thing there. She was. Um. All you guys were let go at the same time. Me and her. Yeah. In terms of on air. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's crazy. Because that's something I've always wondered was how come a black station while playing black music didn't have any real black on air personalities. But now what you're saying to me now that you go back in your mind and process what you said that makes sense. You could only hire who submits or who you're looking for, but they still have to. Being black qualifies you for one, okay, cool. That gets you through the door. But are you good? I'm, I'm shrugging right now. Right. Right? And the thing yeah. is, you know, I think, you know, people's definition of good is perceptual. You know, perceptual. Yeah. Um, but again, me as a radio guy, mm -hmm. my, um, you know, what I require yeah. is going to be more than what the average person is looking for, yeah. I guess, right? Um, you know, there's there's more to it yeah. that I, I don't want to get into now. Fair enough. Um, but it's super unfortunate. Mm -hmm. um, I think it sucks. Mm -hmm. um, I fought hard to make those changes in that building. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not there. Yeah. Crazy. We're going to leave on a high note here now. Last question for you. I knew that I seen a picture with you, took a picture when you were at the Hard Knock Life Tour. Okay. Okay. There was a few pictures was, there. Yeah, that was with um, Jay-Z, DMX. Oh, you're talking about the group picture? Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that one there. Give us a highlight. What was it like to actually, were you promoting it? You were just back. What were you involved in that concert? Then? So, uh, we were at Ener I was at Energy at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, no other stations are playing hip hop, right? And we we were the presenting station, mm -hmm. and I, as the presenting station, we got to have a host intro the concert. Yeah. Um, and so that was my job. So I, you know, I'm at the ACC. There's mm -hmm. 14. I was shook, guy. I couldn't Crazy. believe. So I introed right before um, Red Man and Method Man went on. Okay. Um, that was the only time I was allowed to be on stage. So yeah. I didn't get to do DMX. I didn't get to do Jay. Yeah. But I was there. Mm -hmm. And I was on stage. It was a, a great feel. And I wish, you know, we had cell phone business back then, like cameras and all that stuff. Because yeah. I don't know how we don't have no pictures of me on stage and no video or anything. I don't know how none of that exists. Crazy. Um, but the record labels mm -hmm. um, wanted to present all these artists with their gold and platinum plaques. Mm -hmm. And at the time, apparently, you know, in hindsight, we found out that this was one of the first times during that concert, however long they'd been doing it up to that point, mm -hmm. where they were able to get everybody into that one room at the same time. It just never happened. Crazy. And... Um, and and so we were supposed to have a meet and greet, and we gave away meet and greets as part of our prize pack because mm -hmm. uh, we gave away um, um, uh, a suite, whatever the box, a box, box. suite, yeah. right? I remember the promo exactly because mm -hmm. we created it was called "Live the Good Life" at the Hard Knock Life Tour. Hard so you would be in a catered suite, you'd be in there with me mm -hmm. and a couple other jocks from the radio station, and they would think it was you and five friends or something okay. like that. And so. Um, you know, now I could talk about it, but we, we lined it up so that the person that won was a friend of my wife. And so we just had the box with all our people. 
it was all our peoples in there. So it was me, it was Russell, it was my <laughs> wife, her best friend, her best friend's brother. Um, and so that's yeah. that's how we ended up doing it I or whatever. Know, this just randomly happened. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, I think they they put two and two together <laughs> afterwards. Uh, but it, it, yeah. at the end of the day, mm-hmm. it, it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. And so they took this picture and and um, the weird thing is I uploaded it to the internet a few years ago like when yeah. Instagram started happening I found I have it somewhere at the like a big actual big picture okay. of it right like they sent it to me and um, and I took a picture of it and I put it online and it never existed online before that Yeah. and I think DMX it, it made its way to DMX so he retweeted it and I think Method Man might have retweeted it or re-Instagrammed it or whatever the case yeah. may be and that's kind of where it kind of started to grow, grow legs and, and, and start flying and whatnot. but that was um, that was I, I can't really explain like being in that room with all of them you know what I mean and it was weird and because it was also such a um, hard to keep them all in the same room. We yeah. were all rushing to take our personal picture. So what yeah. the one big picture was taken, yeah. and then so I got a picture with me and Jay. There's a picture with maybe me and Redman, um, and then you know my wife and and her best friend got a picture with Method Man or me and Method Man. And it's just you were trying to get as many pictures as you could with people, mm-hmm. um, but it's very chaotic in there. Not only was it filled with label people, it was filled with all the artists. It was filled with us in terms of. Um, the winners and whatever and so um, you know you you want to have conversations with all these people and it's it's just you know you tell Jay-Z yo man I'm a big fan love the show blah 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 you get a dap us and and that's it right crazy those experiences it's like listen I got a bring you back one other time where we're just just gonna talk about experiences with who you met and interviews, good ones and bad ones and all this. Because this, I wanted this one to be more about, about me. you. I got you. You understand? Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. remember, you lived it. So then we're bringing you back for something like that. We uh, can do that? Yeah, yeah, It's all good. So then listen, 2020, what's next for Mastermind right now? Don't know yet. Yeah. Don't know. Kind of just laying in the cut. A lot of people have presented ideas and, and, and what they would want to see and whatnot. Um, but... Um, I, you know, I don't know. I, yeah. I, I've I've done radio for 33 years, and it's weird to like you know like in terms of changing pr- profession. Yeah, it's like well, I've never done anything else, so I'm gonna go become a I can't electrician. Be, I can't be an accountant or yeah. whatever. You know what I mean? So it's mm-hmm. kind of like um, I just kind of got to see what what plays out. Yeah. I don't know what the next chapter there, is. There's so much. There's so much more, and I know because your life works so strange already. Mm. Some strange thing is gonna happen on a special day in March of 2020. 21 <laughs> something is gonna happen right but mastermind this has been an epic super great conversation well thank brother. you i appreciate you having me man. thank you so very much yeah no doubt let me give you an outro and get you out here all right well ladies and gentlemen this is muscle and this has been another two line music huts entertainment report podcast and we are out this podcast is brought to you by www.twolinedmusichut.com